there's a there's an article that I've dealt with before that talks about the uh, the true story behind the Cleveland summit because people you know when you see the iconic photos you think that it gives the impression that everybody was there for the same reason to support Muhammad Ali okay and the uh, we know it was April 28th 1967 that Ali refused to um, be drafted into the army to go fight in Vietnam and when you see the uh, iconic photos, you think that uh, everybody was there for the same reason. Everybody was there to support uh, uh, Ali. All right. But that wasn't necessarily the case. You had people there for different reasons. Some people were there for selfish reasons. Some people were there to uh, support Ali. All right. So we're going to talk about that uh, on today's show. And then. Um, there has been some bodies found re re uh, relating to the Tulsa race massacre. We know that uh, there's still a number of bodies that need to be found, could be, uh, could be hundreds that need to be found, et cetera. But uh, five more bodies have been found at a mass grave site there in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And people think that uh, these are bodies of people who were killed during the Tulsa race massacre. All right. There's a good uh, article from uh, independent.co.uk uh, about this. So we're going to give an update on what's going on there uh, also. OK. And then. Uh, there was a story that I wanted to get to. In all the uh, you know, I watched the documentary. I watched a number of documentaries dealing with the Tulsa race massacre. You know, I've done a two and a half hour lecture uh, dealing with the Tulsa race massacre. All right. Um, so I watched the documentary on the History Channel. It was an excellent, excellent documentary. Uh, uh, Tulsa burning, Tulsa burning on the History Channel. OK. And in all of the the talk and you know, I read Hannibal B. Johnson's book uh, years ago dealing with uh, Black Wall Street this is one of the best books dealing with the history of Black Wall Street. Black Wall Street uh, from riot to renaissance in Tulsa's Greenwood District by Hannibal B. Johnson. I've done a two and a half hour lecture dealing with the history um, of Tulsa and Black Wall Street, et cetera. So in all of the um, uh, talk about Black Wall Street, the question that has to be asked is, um, how did it go so long and not and and no one talked about it? It wasn't in history books. Uh, articles weren't being written about it. OK, you had a lot of people for decades, a lot of people outside of um, for decades, a lot of people outside of uh, Tulsa or, or outside of uh, Oklahoma didn't even know about it. OK, it wasn't until about 1998 that, you know, we started finding out more about it. So. You know, you have to ask this question. OK, um, so we're going to deal with that as well, because there was a good article that I read that talked about the cover up that took place for decades, the cover up that took place for decades uh, regarding the uh, Tulsa race massacre. How were they able to go so long and it not be talked about? All right, so we'll deal with that as well. Now, on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct your own behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man or a woman's thoughts, you can control the circumference of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Now, we deal with a number of different topics here on the African History Network show. We deal with current events in history, politics, education, economic empowerment, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828. To sign up for our email newsletter, text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828, the sign up for our email newsletter. Also visit our website, 
AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Um, you can still register for the online course that I teach on Saturdays, uh, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. This is a, um, I'm adding an additional week, is a 10 week uh, online course that I teach. We do with thousands of years of history and what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Um, our special guest speaker on Saturday, June 12th is going to be Dr. David M. Hotep, author of the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. Uh, I was had been trying to get in touch with him. He's been on vacation for three weeks. But uh, he called me this past uh, Thursday. So he's going to be uh, he's going to present to my class again. You don't want to miss this because he's going we'll deal with uh, the premise of his book. We'll deal with the evidence of the African presence in the Americas going back at least uh, in this land that we call the United States, the United States of America, going back at least um, 50, 51,700 years ago. These are the Khoisan who come from southern Africa and have the oldest uh, DNA on the planet. And uh, they're the ancestors to Dainu and the Twa, and they go all around the world. Uh, so he's going to be uh, the guest speaker for my class. He's going to do an excellent presentation. You'll be able to ask questions as well. So uh, we're going to post a link here for the online course. Also, you can visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, it's regularly $130. It's on sale 54% off. We're about halfway through the class, so it's on sale $60. Uh, we do the class live, but all the sessions are archived. Uh, we record all the sessions so you can go back and watch them over and over again. OK, we record all the sessions so you can go back and watch them over and over again uh, as well. OK, so there's ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. All right. Let me uh, I want to jump into uh, this topic. Uh, before we come up on a break, how's everybody doing? All right, so a lot of people have seen the uh, iconic photo uh, from June uh, 4th, 1967. June 4th, 1967. And it's, it, it's, it's called the Muhammad Ali Summit, the Muhammad Ali Summit, all right? And you had um, Hall of Fame running back Jim Brown, uh, who presided over the meeting. You had... Uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who was Lou Alcindor at the time, Carl Stokes, uh, Walter Beach, Bobby Mitchell. Uh, all these people came out in support of Ali. All right. And originally, before, you know, I came across this information, I thought everybody was there, you know, this, you know, for the same reason. OK, I thought everybody was there for the same reason. I had no idea that you had somebody there, some people there who were there for selfish reasons. All right. So it's important to understand this, this timeline, this chronology of, uh, of what happened, all right? So you have uh, April 28th, uh, 1967, April 28th, 1967. Uh, Muhammad Ali refuses to be drafted uh, into the military, okay, into the army to go fight in Vietnam, all right? We know he, um, it, he was a minister in the nation of Islam and he was a conscientious objector and it conflicted with his religious beliefs. Now there's a good article dealing with some of this background information uh, from history.com. April 28th, 1967, Muhammad Ali refuses army induction. April 28th, 1967, Muhammad Ali refuses army induction. All right. So on April 28th, 1967, boxing champion Muhammad Ali refuses to be inducted into the U.S. Army and is immediately stripped of his heavyweight title, immediately stripped of his heavyweight title. Now, I'm a big Ali fan. If you look at the background, you can probably see that. <laughs> and I got another frame picture, uh, picture of Muhammad Ali over out, out, of, out of camera shot, okay? So I'm a big Muhammad Ali fan. You see, I have one of my Muhammad Ali shirts on on today, okay? Uh, and I remember when I was a little kid, so growing up in the 70s, right? Uh, ABC Wild World of Sports used to come on Saturdays and we, we used to get to see the Muhammad Ali fights. Right. So <laughs> I used to run around the house and say Muhammad Ali is my brother. 
Muhammad Ali is my brother because this is nineteen seventy. You still have you know we went afros. You still have you know black pride and things like this, right? So Muhammad Ali was a big hero to children. Okay, so I'm still a Muhammad Ali fan. Um, so he refuses to be uh, uh, drafted uh, in the military. Okay, a uh, good article from uh, History.com uh, dealing with this. And let me pull, go back over to this here. Just a second. Okay. Hold on. All right. So on. Uh, he was. So we know he was born Cassius Marsalis Clay in Louisville, Kentucky, January fourteenth, nineteen forty-two. And uh, this past uh, Thursday, June third, was the fifth anniversary of his passing. Now. Um, Ali refused to be inducted into the armed forces, saying, I ain't got no quarrel with those Viet Cong. On June 20th, 1967, Ali was convicted of draft evasion. He was sentenced to five years in prison. He was fined $10,000 and banned from boxing for three years. He stayed out of prison as his case was appealed and returned to the ring on October 26, 1970 knocking out Jerry Quarry in Atlanta in the third round. When we come back from the break, we're going to deal with this iconic photo uh, of the Cleveland Summit and deal with the real history behind that. You listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation of Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation of Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Sunday, uh, June 6, 2021. And we are live. Hope everybody's doing well. Call in numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call in number if uh, you have a question or comment. All right. And also, thanks for uh, all the birthday wishes. Uh, my birthday is uh, June 7th. But the uh, birthday wishes have been rolling in. So thanks for that as well. Appreciate that. I'll be 50. Years old, a lot of people can't believe I'll be 50. Well, you know, I don't drink, I don't, I don't do drugs, I don't smoke, don't don't drink alcohol, don't smoke weed, don't I don't do none of that stuff. So I'm a vegetarian, I've been vegetarian for 16 years now. You know, so <laughs> I don't do any of that. All right, but uh thanks anyway. Okay, right before the break, and I'll be you know, I'll let you know about Atlanta. I'll be in Atlanta. Uh, for the uh, the tenth annual or the ninth annual Juneteenth Festival, uh, Friday, June eighteenth through Sunday, June twentieth. Uh, so I'll be there. Visit JuneteenthATL.com for more information. I'll be speaking there as well uh, that Saturday and Sunday, three p.m. in the uh, in the amphitheater. Okay, so right before the break, we were talking about um, the Cleveland Summit, the famous Cleveland Summit, and you see that you have this famous iconic photo of Muhammad Ali being surrounded by all all these African American athletes and you know d- different things like this Bill Russell and Lou Alcindor who's going to change his name to Kareem Abdul Jabbar and uh all of this there right and this was um regarding his uh protests of the Vietnam War and him refusing to be drafted okay so he refused to be drafted on April 28th, 1967, April 28th, 1967. And there's a good article from uh, history.com, official website of the History Channel, that uh, gives you some of this background information. Uh, let me flip over to this right here. Uh, Muhammad Ali refuses army induction, April 28th, 1967. Okay. So check that out from history.com. And we also know that on uh, March 30th, uh, 1967, before, uh, about a month before Ali refuses to be drafted, he had a meeting with someone very, very important. A lot of people don't know this. We'll talk about that in just a second. But let's go. Let's go back to um, what happened here. So he refused to be drafted. He's going to be stripped of. Uh, he's immediately stripped of his boxing title. All right. And we know Ali said, "I ain't got no quarrel with those Viet Cong." Uh, on June twentieth, nineteen sixty-seven, Ali was convicted of draft evasion, 
sentenced, sentenced to five years in prison, fined ten thousand dollars, and banned from boxing for three years. Okay, he was able to stay out of prison on appeal. He finally won his case in the U.S. Supreme Court. Okay, and they agreed that he was a conscientious objector and fighting in the Vietnam War uh, conflicted with his religious beliefs. So he was able to, uh, you know, box again. Eventually, uh, when uh, eventually won his title back uh, from George Foreman in uh, 1974. I think it was October 30th, 1974. Okay, um, with the Rumble in the Jungle, which became um, renamed the Ropadope. They fought in Zaire. All right. So March 30th. Uh, March 30th, 1967, Muhammad Ali had a meeting with Dr. King. A lot of people don't know that Muhammad Ali and Dr. King had a secret friendship. And, you know, I can understand, uh, I can understand why they may want to keep something like that secret because Dr. King is a Baptist minister and, and Muhammad Ali is a black Muslim. You ain't supposed to be with those black Muslims. What you doing with them? So <laughs> sometimes, you know, <laughs> you got to keep white people out your business. I'm just <laughs> I don't want that. I don't want it to sound crazy, but <laughs> sometimes, you know, <laughs> everything don't, you know, uh, today it may be hard for people to believe because everything's on social media. But uh, sometimes, you know, <laughs> like I said, uh, like I said on my Friday show. When we talked about uh, the Okoy massacre on November 2nd, 1920 and reparations, uh uh, a, 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 a reparations bill, and I didn't call it a reparations bill, but that's what it is. It's a type of reparations uh, passed the, the, the Florida state legislature uh, because uh, state Senator um, uh, Randolph Bracey put, put the bill inside of the state budget bill and it passed the state legislature and Governor Ron DeSantis, Republican, Donald Trump supporter, signed it in the law, but it's to set aside three hundred five thousand dollars to give uh, scholarships to descendants of the survivors of the Okoy massacre, whether those descendants live in Florida or not. And then what's left over after you distribute it to descendants can go to African-American students. OK, and now he didn't call it reparations because he said he had to be smart about it because he wanted to get the bill passed. See, this is why I said um, when you study history of slavery in this country. There was a reason why most slaves who ran away ran away at nighttime and not in the daytime. See, there was a reason why. Okay, so everything is supposed to be on social media. Anything is supposed to be out there. Sometimes, you know, you got to keep white people out of your business. So they had a secret friendship. All right. <laughs> a lot of people didn't know about this. I don't blame them. Because <laughs> uh, it's good. you're going to have more problems and have to do more explaining and all this stuff. So everything don't need to be out in public. But they had a meeting uh, March 30th, 1967. Now, this is, a, this, this is a really good article. This is a really, everything all right on that end? Okay. This is a really good article from uh, biography.com, biography.com. Muhammad Ali, I mean, Martin Luther King Jr. and Muhammad Ali's surprising secret friendship. All right. Now, they, they had a meeting March 30th. We're going to go to clip... Uh, Clip one, I think it is, uh, Jalen. Uh, they had a meeting March 30th, 1967. And the, the meeting was in private. They came out of the meeting and spoke briefly with the media. Yeah, clip one. Uh, we're about to go to that. Uh, they came out and spoke to the media briefly to talk a little bit about what they talked about behind closed doors, but not much. All right. Here's this clip. Let's go. Let's go to what happened. Um. Uh, Let's go to this clip, Jalen. What did you discuss back in the hotel room? Nothing. Just friends, just like the cruise ship and, and uh, Kennedy and <laughs> everybody. When the people, all of the politicians of all other white races come together, and they, although they believe different, they think different, whites can come together and discuss the common cause. But whenever a few of us come together, the world is shook up. And I say, whatever went back there is our business. Reverend King, do you agree? Oh, yes, yes. We had a very good discussion uh, on uh, many matters. And, of course, these are not things that we would discuss here. But uh, we do have common problems and common concerns. And above all, 
as uh, Muhammad Ali has just said, uh, we are all victims of the same system of oppression. And even though we may have different religious uh, beliefs, uh, this does not at all it's bring right. about a difference in Still terms brothers. of our concern. Uh, do you share the same? Do one more question. Do you share the same concern uh, that uh, Muhammad has for his draft status? Oh, I certainly do. Uh, my, my views on the draft are clear. I'm against it. And I think the sooner our country does away with the draft, the better it will be for everybody. I'm very disturbed about the militaristic posture of our nation. And I think until we have a radical reordering of priorities in our country, uh, we are going more and more to the depths and, I should say, to the doom that follows arrogance of power, Senator Fulbright said. Okay. All right, pause it right there. Pause it right there. All right. So they're giving you a little insight into what they talked about. And uh, Muhammad Ali said that uh, Nikita Khrushchev and uh, John F. Kennedy, they can meet, okay, and it's not a problem. But when you have a Baptist minister and uh, uh, a minister of the Nation of Islam meet, now all of a sudden it's a problem. So at this time, March 30th, 1967, so Malcolm X was assassinated February 21st, 1965. At this time, when these two brothers met, they were probably the most recognized uh, African-American men in the country, probably the most recognized African-American men in the country. And they are both in opposition to the Vietnam War. So April 4th, so this is March 30th, 1967, that this meeting took place between Dr. King and Malcolm X. I mean, uh, between Dr. King and Muhammad Ali. OK, Dr. King and Malcolm X met March 26th. Um, 1964, the U.S. Senate debate for the um, Civil Rights Act in 1964. So when these two meet here, they are probably the most recognizable African-American men in the country. They're both against the Vietnam War. And April of 67, they're going to take really make bold statements against the Vietnam War. So April 4th, 1967, Dr. King delivers his first his first public speech in opposition to the Vietnam War called Beyond Vietnam. That's April 4th, 1967. Exactly one year later, he's assassinated, April 4th, 1968. And overnight, after he delivers the speech uh, Beyond Vietnam, overnight he becomes the most hated man in America, basically. All right? And then April 28th, 1967, and, and in the same month, April 4th, Dr. King comes out with his first speech against the Vietnam War and denounces it. We already knew he was against it, but he comes out with a speech against it beyond Vietnam. And then later that same month, April 28, 1967, Muhammad Ali refuses to be drafted into the army to fight in Vietnam. OK, that's both April 1967. So in June of 67, June 4th of 1967, you have the Cleveland summit that takes place. Okay. You have this meeting that takes place, uh, the summit, and it's surrounding Muhammad Ali's, Muhammad Ali, pro his protest against the Vietnam War. So there's a good article from the undefeated that gives background information on this, uh, this meeting. And that's what we're going to, uh, discuss so let me pull this up here um just one second okay the cleveland summit and muhammad ali the true story okay the cleveland summit and muhammad ali the true story from the undefeated and before you know we talked about this article here on the show maybe a couple of years ago something like that uh, and before reading this article, you know, I thought everybody was there in support of Ali, but that ain't exactly what happened. So a, um, on Sunday, June 4th, 1967, some of the greatest black athletes in the country gathered in a nondescript office building in Cleveland, Ohio. According to legend and countless media reports in subsequent years that 
failed to challenge uh, in sub subsequent years that failed to challenge that legend, the athletes had come together to decide whether to lend their support to Muhammad Ali, who had been stripped of his heavyweight title and faced charges of draft dodging for his refusal to serve in the Vietnam War. Now, Muhammad Ali needed support. OK. And, and you know, and that is true. Uh, ever since, and you know, Muhammad Ali became one, that, a lot of people already did not like Ali because he talked so much and he was winning, he was the champion, he, um, he was beating white men up too, but he was speaking out, He's, he joined the Nation of Islam, okay, we know after he wins the championship February 25th, 1964, uh, then he announces that he's joined the Nation of Islam, he announces his new name, Muhammad Ali, all right. And that really gave white people a, a reason not to like him. And some African-Americans didn't like him either. OK, because they were against the nation of Islam. They were against Malcolm X, the whole the whole number of things taking place. So ever since uh, Muhammad Ali changed his name from Cassius Clay. And joined the and joined the nation of Islam and refused to join the military, he had become one of the most reviled men in the nation hated almost as much by African-Americans as by many white Americans. So the fact that other African-American athletes would convene in support of Ali held significance. The men meeting in Cleveland that day, including Jim Brown, Bill Russell, and Lou Alcindor, who's going to change his name later to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, they were widely admired. Okay, now the... Um, there were multiple interests at play in that room and differing conceptions of the best way to advance the position of African-Americans. OK, so there you have in the picture that you see, you have different people there with different ideas of what should be done and people there with different motives. You know, because I've seen this picture a number of times in the past and I thought everybody was there surrounded, supporting Ali. OK, well, that's not exactly what happened. <laughs> so. Um, some of the men were ex-military. Others had economic stakes in the outcome of either Ali. Allowing himself to be drafted, going to fight in a war or not. Now, before the meeting in Cleveland on June 4th, 1967, boxing promoter Bob Arum. Bob Arum, who's a legend in, in boxing, and others, including prominent members of the Nation of Islam, tried to persuade Muhammad Ali, tried to persuade Muhammad Ali to accept a deal that one of Bob Arum's law partners had negotiated with the government. Okay? So Bob, so you got this, you got this deal, and, you, and you're gonna have this closed circuit deal uh, as well, closed circuit TV. OK, so. Uh, boxing promoter Bob Aaron Aram and others, including prominent members of the Nation of Islam, tried to persuade Ali to accept a deal that. One of uh, Bob Aram's law partners had negotiated with the U.S. government, if Muhammad Ali would agree to perform boxing exhibitions for U.S. troops, the draft dodging charges would be dropped. If he if he allowed himself to be drafted into the military and he agreed to uh, perform boxing exhibitions like Joe Lewis did when Joe Lewis was uh, in, in the army as a sergeant in the army, then they would drop the uh, draft evasion charge uh, the draft dying charges. All right. Now, if you watch um, the movie, the greatest, the greatest from the late 1970s and Muhammad Ali plays himself in the greatest. They have the scene where he refuses to be drafted and then the ranking officer there at the draft board, you know, calls him into the office and they talk and he says, you know, if you uh, go to Vietnam, you know, we're not going to put you on the front line with a rifle in your hand. You're going to do, you know, boxing exhibitions like Joe Lewis did, things like that. OK. And Muhammad Ali says something to the effect of he said, if 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 I go. And allow myself to be drafted and I go into the war, you're going to use that 
you're going to use me being in the military as an excuse to say it's all right for the war to take place. And it's all right for, you know, other black people to be drafted. You know, and he said, you know, you're not going to use me like that. He said, I'd rather just go to jail right now. So they struck this deal. And if Ali allowed himself, to, if, if Ali agreed to be the going to the military, he, he would do boxing exhibitions. All right. Now, when you listen to people like Kwame Ture, Stokely Carmichael. The, the whole anti-war movement got a huge boost when the reigning heavyweight champion of the world, Muhammad Ali, refused to be drafted into the military. And, and, and Stokely Carmichael talked about this. And one of the things, I, I saw a video of him at the time, one of the things he was saying is that there are places in Louisville, Kentucky, that Muhammad Ali can't go because of segregation. Even though this is after the 64 Civil Rights Act. He said there's still places that he can't go, but they want him to go to Vietnam to fight for freedom in Vietnam that black people don't have in this country. I mean, that was before the, the 1968 uh, Fair Housing Act was passed. So you have all these dynamics taking place. Now, at the time, Bob Arum, Arum, A-R-U-M, was running a company called Main Bout, M-A-I-N-B-O-U-T, Main Bout, which controlled the closed circuit television rights for Muhammad Ali's fights. Main Bout needed Muhammad Ali to attract closed circuit viewers. Okay, otherwise you can't make the money. Among Bob Arum's partners in Main Bout were Jim Brown, who you see center, who presided over the meeting, Jim Brown, and two leading figures in the Nation of Islam, Herman Muhammad, son of uh, Nation of Islam uh, leader, uh, Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and John Ali, okay? And even when you, when you go and watch The Greatest, they show, you know, the Nation of Islam being involved in, in managing him at one point, you know, managing him being involved in setting up his fights, things like this. You see that it, it, in the... Um, in the movie Ali, played by uh, um, Will Smith, you see that also uh, depicted in the film. In the in the films, okay. So um, John Ali, uh, at the time the, the Nation of Islam's national secretary, uh, to, uh, the writer of the article is uh, Jonathan Eig E I G. He said John Ali told me that he and Herbert Muhammad profited personally from the agreement with Maine Bout, with Bob Arum, A-R-U-M. It, it was not a deal with the Nation of Islam. It was, it was the deal that they had with Bob Arum. Okay, these two had with Bob Arum. It was, it was not a deal with the Nation of Islam. Now, that meant that Bob Arum and um, Jim Brown, Herbert Muhammad and John Ali, all had an incentive to get Muhammad Ali in the ring as soon as possible. A lot of money was on the line. In addition to this, Bob Arum told Jim Brown that if he and other African-American athletes could persuade Muhammad Ali to resume boxing, the athletes would be rewarded with local closed circuit franchises. Okay. It, it, Bob Arum Bob Aram told Jim Brown that if uh, he, that if Jim Brown and other African American athletes could persuade Muhammad Ali to resume boxing, okay, it would not just resume boxing, go into the military, be drafted into the military and resume boxing. Then these athletes who convinced them to do this would be rewarded with local closed circuit franchises. Because, see, one of the things that people were saying is that and even if you watch the movie um the greatest they say something to the fact that okay well if you refuse to go into the military that's going to hurt the morale of black soldiers in the military but the anti-vietnam war protesters regardless of race they got a big boost they it was it it, it, it 
gave them a big boost to have Ali refuse to fight in Vietnam and refuse to allow himself to be used like that. So, in essence, a portion of the proceeds from Muhammad Ali's fights would go to these athletes who convinced him to uh, go into the military and fight again. Now, Jim Brown, who organized the meet, meeting known as the Cleveland Summit that took pay, place June 4th, 1967, had already retired as the NFL's all time leading rusher a couple of years earlier. And he was working as an actor while also pursuing his interest in black economic empowerment. All right. And then when you see um, the, uh, the movie directed by Regina King, One Night in Miami. OK, you see. Uh, Jim Brown, you know, some talking about uh, you see Jim Brown and Muhammad Ali are friends there. And Jim Brown is some talking about, you know, economic empowerment and different things like this. Uh, let's flip over to this article here. This is from the um, the undefeated, the undefeated dot com, the Cleveland Summit and Muhammad Ali, the true story. All right. This is a deep this is a deep history but, uh, behind this. And like I said, for years, I just saw the photo and, you know, I, I, I saw it talked about in documentaries and things like some documentaries to say, oh, they all rallied around Ali, blah, blah, blah. But no, that's not that's not the backstory. Some were there who, who agree with Ali. Others didn't. You know, others are trying to get Ali to fight again. So let's go back to this here. We'll go to the phone lines in just a minute. Three, one, three, seven, seven, eight. 7600 is the call in number. If you have a quick question or comment, 313-778-7600 is the call in number. If you have a quick question or comment. All right. Now, uh, so Jim Brown organized the meeting. He had retired from the NFL uh, a couple of years prior. And Jim Brown invited not only Bill Russell, but also Lou Alcindor, okay? Lou Alcindor was playing for uh, UCLA at the time, and he had not changed his name to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar yet. But also, uh, Jim Brown invited Sid Williams and Walter Beach of the Cleveland Browns football team, Curtis McClinton of the Kansas City Chiefs, Bobby Mitchell and Jimmy Shorter of the Washington, uh, but they don't call them the Skins anymore. They, they used to call them that, but the Washington football team. And Willie Davis of the Green Bay Packers. Also present was Carl Stokes, uh, at the time a prominent attorney in Cleveland, who would later be elected as the first African American mayor, first African American mayor of a major city, okay, city of Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, he, he would be elected uh, that November, okay, November 1967. So you see Carl Stokes there as well. Now the meeting was held in the offices of uh jim brown's negro industrial and economic union okay the negro industrial and economic union and and it had only one purpose according to bob aram quote to convince muhammad ali to take the deal because it opened up tremendous opportunities for black athletes end quote to take the deal because it opened up tremendous opportunities for black athletes because if, if the black athletes who could convince him to take this deal well they're going to get these closed circuit uh uh pay-per-view these closed circuit deals okay so there's a lot of this economic opportunity here so bob aram said quote i wasn't setting it up for the athletes to rally around ali i wasn't setting it up for at for the athletes to rally around ali all right, let me flip back over to this so you can see this. Because you're going to say, that ain't what it says. I ain't never heard that before. Blah, blah, blah. I'm trying to tell you, there's a, there was a lot of money. And, and see, here's the thing. See, probably the best documentary on uh, Muhammad Ali, I think, I think it's called The Ultimate Ali, something like that, is six hours. I have it on DVD. I bought it from Best Buy years ago. It's a three DVD documentary. It's six hours. Probably the best one on Ali. And 
he talks one of the things he talks about he talks about how much money he lost by refusing to fight by, refu by refusing to be drafted being stripped of his title not being able to box talks about how much money he lost okay millions of dollars that he lost and he said he he, he would rather be broke then then go fight in the military, then go serve in Vietnam. Not even just fight, not even fight, but go serve in Vietnam. Cause he said, I know they're going to use that as an excuse. They're going to market that to try to lure more black people to go fight and, and they're going to get killed. Okay. All right. Let's go. Uh, we're coming up here on the break. Let's go quickly to the phone lines. Let's go to uh, Wadsworth, uh, line one. Hey, Wadsworth, thanks for holding. Uh, tell us where you're calling from. You call him from Detroit, right? I'm from West Bloomfield. West Bloomfield. Okay, West go ahead. All right. <laughs> and I, I, and I, I do have two questions. Go ahead. I, 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 I have one question, and uh, I, I got two questions for you. Uh, okay, go ahead. The first question was this. Okay, the first question is this. Uh, when you did a video, uh, I, I, I don't know where, because you, because you walked down to quit the cut. And when you went down to clean the cut, uh, I, I want to know what, like, what is the clean the cut, and is that part of the clean the road? Or, or, the clean the cut is, is the clean the cut is right here on Lafayette uh, and Orleans, right here near downtown Detroit. Lafayette and Orleans. That's where the clean the cut is <laughs> here in Detroit. But what did they get the name? Uh, what did they get the name from the clean the cut? Do they, do they, uh, it's named after what well, the Quinder, the same place where the Quinder Road is named after. It was a man here. He was a slave owner, also, if I remember correctly. Uh, the Quinder here in Detroit. And, 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 my, and my next question is this: my, my, I, 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 I do want to wish you happy birthday to you. Happy birthday! But since you turned fifty, I, 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 are you good now? Are you going to take the vaccine? Or are you not going to take the vaccine? Oh, that don't have anything to do with age. <laughs> that don't have anything to do with age, man. But anyway. All right. What you said before, you said before, because you were going to take it. But if you're like six or seven, if you're older, because you may consider taking it. Oh, that don't have anything to do with age. Yeah, that don't have anything to do with age, man. If I, if I decide to take it, it has nothing to do with age. I still look young also. Okay, it has to do with, has to do with understanding the science and understanding the risk out here. Because I know people, I know people who were, uh, I, I know people who were in the holistic health and, and, and didn't do vaccinations. And, you know, unfortunately, they got COVID. So, but anyway, all right. All right, Wadsworth. Thanks for calling. Keep listening. All right. Okay. Uh, let me see. All right, let's continue here. We've got a few minutes before the, we'll have a couple of minutes before the break. Let's continue. All right, so um, Bob Aram, according to Bob Aram, he said to convince Ali to take the deal because it opened up uh, tremendous opportunities for black athletes. All right, um, and then he said I wasn't setting it up for the athletes to rally around Ali. Now several of the men in Cleveland were military veterans. Several of the men who, who were there at the Cleveland summit were military veterans. Some believed Elijah Muhammad's separatist ideology. Okay. Uh, some, believe, uh, his, uh, some of them believed his uh, ideology was racist. Some believed that uh, Elijah Muhammad's separatist ideology was racist. Um, and, you know, they disagreed with it. And they said if it was followed, then that would lead to an American apartheid. So you had some some people who were there. They disagreed with uh, Elijah Muhammad. Okay, disagreed with the, the the ideology of the Nation of Islam. Some who were there were military veterans. All right, and uh, they arrived intent on challenging Muhammad Ali, challenging his position. Um, Davis of the Green Bay Packers said, quote, my first reaction was that it was unpatriotic, okay, referring to Muhammad Ali's anti-war stance. And uh, Davis was one of three men in the room who confirmed Bob Aram's version of the story as well, okay? He was one of three men in the room who confirmed Bob Aram's story. 
story. Now, Muhammad Ali worked the, the room like it was his birthday party, cracking jokes and talking to everyone at once. Uh, when men aimed uh, hard questions at him, the boxer never got defensive. He spoke passionately and confidently. Um, and now the halfback for the um, Kansas City Chiefs, Curtis McClinton, Curtis McClinton, um, was a member of the Army's active reserves at the time. And he told Muhammad Ali that while he respected the, uh, uh, Muhammad Ali's religion, it was important to remember his nationality too, T-O-O. It was important to remember his nationality too. Um, Curtis McClinton said he told Muhammad Ali, quote, hey man, all you got to do is get a uniform and you'd be boxing at all the bases around the country. Your presence on military bases gives that motivation to military men, end quote. All right, we're coming up here on the break. Uh, you listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. Uh, we'll be back in a few minutes. Gain knowledge in minutes from insightful summaries of progressive and socially conscious books. Blacklisted gives you access to curated content that will satisfy your curiosity to learn and understand different perspectives. Empower yourself through inspirational and actionable ideas. It's easy to read or listen to on the go. Blacklisted. Empower yourself. Start your free trial today. Are you getting ready for fall or winter? We have the solution for all seasonal clothing needs. Cometicwear.com is the go-to online source for Cometic African fashion and lifestyle products with a contemporary twist. We're committed to offering unique styles reflecting our African heritage. Cometicwear.com is inspired by Cometicscribes.com to influence our people in learning and showing pride. Please visit our website at cometicwear.com. We all know the cannabis industry is headed toward an uprise in the past decade. What happens when there is a brand that brings this uprise in a blow? The cannabis industry welcomes her uprise. Hustle her hemp. Delivering excellence with pride is her watchword, and how you choose to embrace it makes it a priority. From cultivating rich cannabis into exquisite and tastefully finished CBD products to delivery, Hustler Hemp leaves no stone unturned. Hustler Hemp's mission is to empower women of color by building business and creating legacies, uniting beauty, health, and business. We are a pure definition of how we want the CBD industry to become in the future. While we are redefining innovation, we bring the same energy to improving the quality of life. Hustle Her Hemp is the new Uprise. Hi, I'm Joel Wilson, President and CEO of JCW Computer Consulting LLC a technology implementation firm with over 20 years of satisfying customers. We offer a full spectrum of industry top-tier branded services. We are an authorized partner or reseller for Lenovo, Zoom, T-Mobile, Microsoft 365, and Surface tablets, Google Workspace, Acer, Asus, Samsung, PCmatic security software, and many more. Our online store features laptops, Chromebooks, computers, printers, accessories, and software. Businesses, take advantage of our free one-hour Zoom tech consultation and know we offer top nationwide high-speed internet service providers, voice over IP, and cellular phone services. Home users, don't miss our current in-stock Chromebook inventory. Please visit us at jcwcc.com or call 215-879-6701. Digital Dandelion's technical solutions works with businesses like yours to create an operations manual for your business, which is something many businesses don't have. 
According to AARP, more than 30% of small business owners are over 50 years old. Many business owners want to retire by selling their businesses or by passing their businesses on to their children. However, according to Forbes Investment Advisors, many retiring owners attempt to sell their businesses or retirement fail. You cannot sell your business without a business manual. Your children also cannot inherit your business because there is no way to run it. Your business does not have to die when you leave. Their business Bible products will give you the tools you need for a thriving business that can make you money even after you retire. Are you looking at increasing your business's annual revenue? Digital dandelions can help you make at least $100,000 in annual revenue and expand your business. Speak with them today about solidifying your business. Visit digitaldandelions.com today and get a free 30-minute consultation. Hi, I'm Joel Wilson, President and CEO of JCW Computer Consulting, LLC, a technology implementation firm with over 20 years of satisfying customers. We offer a full spectrum of industry top-tier branded services. We are an authorized partner or reseller for Lenovo, Zoom, T-Mobile, Microsoft 365, and Surface tablets, Google Workspace, Acer, Asus, Samsung, PCmatic security software, and many more. Our online store features laptops, Chromebooks, computers, printers, accessories, and software. Businesses, take advantage of our free one-hour Zoom tech consultation and know we offer top nationwide high-speed internet service providers, voice over IP, and cellular phone services. Home users, don't miss our current in-stock Chromebook inventory. Please visit us at jcwcc.com or call 215-879-6701. 910 AM Superstation, a division of Adele Media. The views and opinions expressed on any program are those of the producers and or the persons appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of 910 AM Superstation or Adele Media. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM Superstation, the future radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Sunday, June 6, 2021, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well. Um, you can give us a call if you have a quick question or comment. 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call in number. If you have a quick question or comment. So we're talking about the uh, Cleveland Summit. The Cleveland Summit. Supporting for Muhammad Ali. Also called the Muhammad Ali Summit. It took place on June 4th, 1967. June 4th, 1967. Now, we also know that uh, this past week, uh, June 3rd, we commemorated the uh, five year uh, and a fifth year anniversary of the passing of Muhammad Ali as well. He passed away June 3rd, 2016. So it's been five years since the greatest of all time. Uh, passed away. So uh, we're dealing with the real story behind the Cleveland summit. Everybody's seen the uh, iconic photo of the African-American athletes. Jim Brown presided over the meeting, you know, Jim Brown and, and Lou Alcindor. And um, you had prominent attorney Carl Stokes, who's going to be elected as mayor of Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, later that year in November, you had Bill Russell, Huge star with the Boston Celtics, um, won you know won the championship, NBA championship numerous times. Actually, won a total of nine, I think it was nine, with the Boston Celtics, it was something like that. Because uh, I, I I remember the you know everybody's talking, to, everybody was saying, okay, who's the greatest? Is it Michael Jordan? Is it LeBron? Is it Kobe? And, and then comparing rings, and then <laughs> uh, Bill Russell. Uh, Posted and he posted his rings and Bill Russell has more. He has more than all of them. Let me see something here. Uh, yeah, he eleven. Yeah, eleven. Because I remember posting that article. Bill Bill Russell posted. <laughs> he, he pretty much shut down the argument. He said, "You want to count rings? I've got 11. 
Uh, yeah, because I remember posting an article uh, about that as well. Yeah, Bill Russell has 11. Uh, let me see here. We got a good article dealing with this. Okay, we'll try to find that. Um, I can't remember which um, publication that was, but I posted a really good article about that as well. But we'll, we'll find something. Um, Legend Profile. I think NBA.com may have something on it, something on him also. Looks like they do. NBA.com, uh, Bill Russell. But yeah, he had, Bill Russell has 11 rings. Okay, so <laughs> if you count the rings, uh, I think you got, I think Bill Russell won that already. If you're counting rings, all right. Now, if you want to count something else, all right. But if you want to count rings, you can count who won who won the most championships. Uh, <laughs> that's a simple math problem right there. So we're talking about some background information uh, dealing with this. Now, before we get into that very quickly here, uh, before we go back to that very quickly, um, you can still register for the online course that I teach on Saturdays. 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We deal with thousands of years of history, and we deal with what led up to the transatlantic slave trade uh, taking place, okay? And our guest speaker uh, for our class on Saturday, June 12th, is going to be none other than Dr. David M. Hotep, author of the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. And he's going to deal with the premise of his book, uh, we, we have a slideshow presentation as well. He's going to deal with the premise of his book. He'll deal with the African presence in this country dating back at least 51,700 years ago. Uh, this, these are the Khoisan who have the oldest DNA on the planet. This is his book here. It's out of print. He's working on this. His, his latest one is almost done. I put him in contact with a publisher because he has to get his footnotes done and his index. OK, uh, but his book is fantastic. His first one has 713 footnotes, but he's going to deal with the evidence of an African presence in this country going back at least 51,700 years ago. He'll talk about some new archaeological discoveries. He'll talk about his new book that'll be out any month now, The First Americans Were Africans Revisited. And we'll probably talk some about Muhammad Ali because he was Muhammad Ali's nutritionist for Ali's last seven fights. He has a ton of stories to talk about about Ali. He has a new book coming out about his time with Muhammad Ali as well. So this is going to be uh, Saturday, June 12th. 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Now you can watch from around the world. It's not on. It's not on Facebook or YouTube. This is my online school. All right. Uh, we're going to post a link here. You can register here also at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can register as well. This is a 10-week online course that I teach. Uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Maafa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We do the classes live. All the sessions are recorded. You can go back in the archive. You can go back and watch them over and over again. A few weeks ago. Our guest speaker was archaeologist uh, Sister Nubia Wardford, who dealt with the origins of ancient Kush and the African queens of antiquity. So as soon as you register, you can watch that class as well. This past Saturday, we had a fantastic class, um, and we're getting ready for Dr. David M. Hotel. Okay, so uh, the class is regularly $130. It's on sale $60. It's 54% off because we're about halfway through the class. We posted the link here. You can register here or at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. It's right on the home page. So when you go to our website, uh, scroll down, you'll see the information for um, a radio show and you'll see the information also for the um, uh, for the online course as well. OK, let me scroll, yeah, scroll down here and you'll see the information here for the online course. This class is June 12th. Click right there to register here. It takes you to the next page. Click here to enroll. And as soon as you register, you start watching the content. All right. OK, let's continue. So. I'm going to go back here. To. Uh, the iconic photo. All right. So let's continue. Uh, so you had uh, Charles McClinton, who was a halfback for the Kansas City Chiefs. And he was trying to, he was also uh, part of the Army's act. He was a um, Army reservist at the time. 
And he was trying to convince Muhammad Ali to uh, box and be drafted into the military. Now, the meeting went on for hours, but Muhammad Ali never budged. When it was over, Jim Brown led the group to a news conference. Muhammad Ali announced, quote, there's nothing new to say. Perhaps recognizing that reporters expected him, expected him to make big news by backing down from his anti-war stance. Other participants said they were convinced Ali was sincere in his religious conviction. OK, other participants said they were convinced they were convinced that Muhammad Ali was sincere in his religious conviction. Now, two weeks later, an all white jury needed only 20 minutes to find Muhammad Ali uh, guilty of draft evasion. His exile from boxing would continue for three more years. The U.S. Supreme Court eventually reversed his conviction in uh, 1971. Given that the Cleveland summit had little impact on, on Muhammad Ali's decision about the draft, why has it become folklore? Why has it become folklore? What took place there did not convince him to change his stance. So the answer is that the story makes us feel good, according to um, Jonathan Eag. And I agree with that because, you know, just seeing that photo and not knowing the background story. You think everybody there is there to support Ali's decision not to be drafted into the into Vietnam. OK, you think everybody's there, black power, whatever. <laughs> that's not the case. <laughs> you <know>? So <laughs> that's why you have to get the, the story behind the picture. So sometimes pictures can be deceiving. So the answer is that the story makes us feel good. It shows athletes and solidarity standing up to power. But in this case, the full story works just as well. It's not better than the myth. Several of the men gathered in Cleveland were military veterans. OK, uh, sorry, several, several of the men gathered uh, were seeking economic opportunity, economic opportunity. When they recognized that they were not going to change Muhammad Ali's mind and they were not going to see any money, from a deal with Bob Arum, they could have walked away. Instead, they used their collective power to support Muhammad Ali. They sacrificed some of their own popularity to stand up for uh, religious freedom and to stand up to a government that seemed to be uh, singling Muhammad Ali out for punishment because he was uh, African-American and outspoken. Now, in an article written for Sports Illustrated after the meeting, Bill Russell said that he envied, envied Muhammad Ali. Quote, he, he has something I have never been able to attain and something very, very few people I know possess. End quote, Bill Russell wrote. He has an absolute and sincere faith. He has an absolute and sincere faith. I'm not worried about Muhammad Ali. He is better equipped than anyone I know to withstand the trials in store for him. What I'm worried about is the rest of us, end quote. This is what Bill Russell wrote. What I'm worried about is the rest of us, okay? That day, Bill Russell and the rest of the men did just fine. All right, so this gives some background information in the competing interests uh, behind the uh, iconic photo uh that you see okay and in the end um you know this it says several of the men gathered in cleveland came seeking economic opportunity when they recognized that they were not going to change ali's mind and they were not going to see any money from a deal with bob Ar bob aram they could have walked away but instead they used their collective power to support uh, Muhammad Ali. They sacrificed some of their own popularity to stand up for uh, religious freedom and to stand up to a government that seemed to be singling out Muhammad Ali for punishment because he was African-American and outspoken. Now, there's a, um, a piece from uh, the Zen Education Project also dealing with this to check out. And they have a video there that uh, I'm not going to play because I know it's a, a huge copyright violation and we're going to get flagged for it. But uh, check this out. 
this is uh let me pull this up just a second this is uh june uh 4th 1967 uh this is the cleveland summit It's in uh, June 4th, 1967. They call it the Muhammad Ali Summit. The Muhammad Ali Summit. Let me pull this up. And there's a, a video. It gives background information. It has some interviews with some of the athletes that were there. Okay. And they're giving uh, their perspective, et cetera. So check this out also. Let's see. Zen Education Project. Just a second here. June 4th, 1967, Muhammad Ali Summit. June 4th, 1967, Muhammad Ali Summit. All right. So check that out as well. Z-I-N-N, -N, Zen Education Project. All right. So it was June 3rd. We're going to go to clip two, Jalen. It was June 3rd, um, 2016. That we got the news that uh, the greatest of all time had passed away. And it was from uh, complications from uh, Parkinson's disease. And I want to go to this clip here. This is from uh, MSNBC. Matt Lauer takes a look back at the life and legacy of the sports and cultural icon uh, Muhammad Ali. Uh, let's go to this clip, Jalen. Lauer had um, the, the great luck and good fortune in life to have been a friend of Muhammad Ali and remained a friend later in life. Matt was close as well to members of the Ali extended family. And tonight for us, Matt Lauer has a look back. Yes, I am the king of the world. Hold it, hold it, hold it. Hold it. Hold it. You're not that pretty. I'm a bad man. He called himself the greatest. He was both adored and at times scorned. He had a lot of threats against him. But with superior skill and a unique style of boxing, <laughs> Muhammad Ali became a cultural icon. Oh, I'm so grateful. Oh, I'm so grateful. Angelo Dundee, Ali's trainer and corner man for over 21 years, passed away in 2012 but was with Ali during some of his most memorable fights. All he had to do was put a mic in his puss. He was sensational. I mean, he was so good, Muhammad. Muhammad Ali was born Cassius Clay on January 17, 1942, in Louisville, Kentucky. When he was 12 years old, his bicycle was stolen. He was so angry that he vowed to whoop whomever stole it. That determination propelled Clay to win two national Golden Glove titles and qualify for the U.S. team at the 1960 Olympics in Rome. I met Cassius in 1958. In 58, he told me he was going to win the Olympics. He won the Olympics in 60. Clay wore his gold medal for two days straight, though he would later throw it into the Ohio River, disillusioned by his second-class treatment when he returned home. With the Olympics behind him, he began his professional boxing career. His first big test was against heavyweight champion Sonny Liston. It was also the first time many would hear Clay's effortless ability to compose a rhyme. If you like to lose your money, then be a fool and bet on Sonny. Liston was heavily favored, but in the end, Clay proved prophetic. They might be some, I guess that might be all. At 22 years old, Clay became the youngest heavyweight champion. What shook up the world? What shook up the world? He quickly shook up the world again by announcing he had joined the Nation of Islam and changed his name. Cassius Clay was my slave name. I'm no longer a slave. Cassius, my Ali's slave. declaration became a lightning rod, with many refusing to acknowledge his new name. Why would you say that? But Howard Cosell, a rising sportscaster, fiercely defended Ali's decision, saying they wanted another Joe Lewis, a white man's black man. Instead, they got Ali, a man who would not conform, regardless of the consequences. At the height of the Vietnam War, Ali refused to serve, declaring himself a conscientious objector and famously saying, I ain't got no quarrel with them Viet Cong. This is his choice, and, you know, every man has a choice of his own religion and beliefs.
Convicted of draft evasion, he was stripped of his heavyweight title and banned from boxing. Muhammad teaches us. For the next three years, he traveled around the country, preaching the principles of Islam and speaking out on race relations. We black people in America are fighting the same common enemy. In 1970, his conviction was overturned, and Ali, now 30 years old, was allowed back into the ring. The couple of wins under his belt, his next opponent, current heavyweight champion, Joe Frazier. An explosive left to the charge. Ali suffers his first professional defeat. Determined to reclaim the title, he trains harder than ever, and epic fights soon follow. In Zaire, fumble in the jungle. Ali wins the title back. Then, the thriller in Manila, the third and final fight with Frazier. Ali would eventually become boxing's first three-time heavyweight champion. And in 1981, with 56 wins and only five losses, he retires at the age of 39. His agility and speech pattern now noticeably different. Did you realize how, how scientific and quick it was? Just three years after retiring, Ali was diagnosed with Parkinson's. And for the rest of his life, that disease would affect his movements and eventually silence his voice. I believe all of you remember Muhammad's pre-Parkinson days when he moved millions with his vibrant voice and his poetic expression. His surprise appearance at 1996 would move the world once again. 3.5 billion people watched the camp delivered another great moment. This was a moment for the whole world to see. Thank you. Ali was married four times, including current wife Lonnie, his partner for more than 25 years. Hey, pause it right there. Pause it right there, Jalen. Pause it right there. Pause it right there. We'll continue on the other side of the break. Uh, you listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation of Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Sunday, June 6, 2021. And we are live. Hope everybody's doing well. Um, right before the break, I was sharing this clip. It backed that clip up about a minute or so, uh, Jalen. We're going to go back to it. So we just finished talking about the real story behind the Cleveland summit, the real story behind the Cleveland summit and the uh, iconic uh, photograph of uh, Muhammad Ali surrounded by the African-American athletes. And that took place on uh, June 4th, 1967. Okay. And we know this past week, June 3rd, was the fifth anniversary of the passing of uh, Muhammad Ali, passed away June 3rd, uh, 2016. So I was sharing this clip here from um, NBC News from uh, the day he passed away, and they do, they did a recap of uh, his life. It's a really good clip. Uh, Matt Lauer is talking about uh, Muhammad Ali. So we're going to go back to this clip. Let's go back to this clip, Jalen. Take it off mute. Six wins and only five losses. He retires at the age of 39. His agility and speech pattern now noticeably different. Did you realize how, how scientific and quick it was? Just three years after retiring, Ali was diagnosed with Parkinson's. And for the rest of his life, that disease would affect his movements and eventually silence his voice. I believe all of you remember Muhammad's pre-Parkinson's days when he moved millions with his vibrant voice and his poetic expression. His surprise appearance of 1996 alone moved the world once again. 3.5 billion people watched the camp 
delivered another great moment. This was a moment for the whole world to <laughs> say thank you. She was married four times, including current wife Lonnie, his partner for more than 25 years. He also had nine children, seven daughters, and two sons. All of them he called a gift from God. Ali wrote that he'd like to be remembered as a man who tried to be a good father, who stood up for his beliefs. Muhammad Ali, the greatest. Those of you actually may be new to the life and times. Oh, is that it? Okay. Yes, that was Okay. All right. Thanks. That was the end of the clip. Okay. So that is from um, that clip. So we got the news late that night, and then they it was airing all day on MSNBC. Okay. But that clip right there is from June 4th, 2016. Muhammad Ali passed away June 3rd, uh, uh, 2016. Okay. So once again, the greatest of all time, rest in peace, Muhammad Ali. And you see me with one of my Muhammad Ali shirts on as well. All right. I want to go to this next story here. And this deals with um, also race massacre. Okay. Now, you know, this past Tuesday, uh, June 1st, you had the 100th commemoration of the Tulsa race massacre. And, you know, now you watch the news, it kind of kind of seems like that didn't take place. Now, we've been talking about it before the commemoration took place. I've been talking about it almost every day since then, because that's what we, you know, that's what we deal with. We deal with history. We do current events. We don't do a bunch of gossip and all that nonsense. I don't have time for that. I have like real content. OK, so I, I don't have time to do that. But there was a. Um, two things. One, the question kept coming up, how was this such a big secret for so long in Tulsa? OK, how was this such a big secret for so long? And there's a good article from History dot com that deals with this, uh, how the Tulsa race massacre was covered up. OK, how the Tulsa race massacre was uh, covered up. And let me pull this up, history.com. And then we also have information dealing with uh, some bodies that were found at a site that they think are bodies of victims of the Tulsa race massacre as well. We'll give you an update on that also. So during the Tulsa race massacre, um, we know that the massacre's victims were hastily buried in unmarked graves. And then a quiet effort began to suppress the memory of the atrocity. All right. We know it was a devastating, uh, violent uh, race massacre. You're going to have, according to uh, Hannibal B. Johnson in his book, Black Wall Street from Ride to Renaissance in Tulsa's historic Greenwood District, we know that you're going to have uh, about 15,000. Uh, white people who descend upon uh, Tulsa, if we look at page 46 of his book, uh, he's talking about the morning of June 1st, 1921. By dawn, some 15,000 whites had amassed ready to strike at the heart of Tulsa's African-American community and strike they did. By 6 a.m., the African-American community had been invaded wholesale by fren frenzied armed white men. White boys as young as 10 years old, armed and unduly disrespectful of both law and person, participated in all aspects of the brutality, mayhem and horror that transpired. Incredibly, whites remained free to taunt and terrorize African-Americans invading their homes and plundering their possessions at will. The long arm of the law did not extend to these acts. The facts, the fate of African-Americans systematically disarmed, rounded up and deprived of their liberty, depended upon the kindness of their captors. 
this law enforcement strategy of neutralizing African Americans virtually assured the total decimation of the black community of the black community. In practice, it left the Greenwood District defenseless and vulnerable and extended an open invitation to the thieves, arsonists and killers who ran roughshod through the streets of Tulsa. We know there was about one point eight million to two million dollars worth of damage. One thousand two hundred and fifty six houses were um, uh, were looted and, and burned. OK, we know at least at least three hundred people were killed. Thousands were left homeless. Uh, many of them had to live in tents uh, over the winter. So you, you ask the question, well, how is it that this was uh, a secret for so long? OK. How is it that this was a secret for so long? There was a concerted effort to intimidate people, to keep uh, this from being taught in schools, to keep this story uh, out of history books. So subsequent generations of people, including those born and raised in Oklahoma, never heard of the Tulsa race massacre. OK, and, and this is something that in doing research on this, this is something I found out. A lot of people who grew up in Tulsa didn't know about this. OK, their family members didn't tell them about it. It wasn't taught in schools, et cetera. And Dr. Tiffany Crutcher, who um, was the uh, uh, whose brother Terrence Crutcher was killed by uh, Betty Shelby, the, uh, the white police officer there in Tulsa, uh, Oklahoma, she said that she didn't know. Uh, about the Tulsa race massacre until she went away to college. And then people in college would ask her, where are you from? And she said, Tulsa. And she said, they said, oh, that's what Black Wall Street was. That's what a race massacre was. But she didn't know anything about it. And then she said in talking to her family members, et cetera, she found out that her great grandmother was a survivor of the Tulsa race massacre. But she never knew about it. OK. So there was a concerted effort not to teach this history, and there was a concerted effort to intimidate uh, African Americans not to talk about it uh, as well. And let me uh, pull up a picture here. Okay. Just a second. All right. Okay, let's let's continue. Three one three seven seven eight seven six hundred is the call in number if you have a quick question or comment. Then I'll let you know what's going on in Atlanta for the Juneteenth Festival because I'll be speaking. I'll be in Atlanta uh, Friday, June eighteenth through Sunday, June ninth, June twentieth. I'll be speaking that Saturday and Sunday at Centennial Park, the ninth annual uh, Juneteenth uh, Atlanta uh, Parade and Music Festival. So subsequent generations of people, including those born and raised in Oklahoma, never heard of the Tulsa race massacre. Starting in the 1990s, a series of events finally began to force the shocking history back into public eye. All right. Now, um, the violence of the Tulsa race massacre was not unique for its uh, uh, for its time. But it was one of a, it was uh, one among a series of mob attacks carried out against the African-American community in the early 20th century. Uh, Tulsa's dark chapter unfolded when Dick Rowland, a 19-year-old African-American shoeshiner, also known as a boot black, he had dropped out of uh, high school there. He was a football player. He was arrested for the authorities say attempted sexual assault. He didn't try to sexually assault Sarah Page, who was 17 years old. And as it turns out, they were lovers. And when you read Hannibal B. Johnson's book, uh, he, he talks about in the book here how Dick Rowland, I think it was Dick Rowland's grandmother, say that uh, Dick Rowland and Sarah Page left uh, uh, Tulsa together, okay, because they were lovers. And in some of the documentaries that uh, came out, that, that, that were shown over the weekend, you know, May 30th, May 31st, June 1st. Some of the documentaries, they talk about that a little bit as well, that they, uh, that uh, Dick Rowland, African-American man, and 17-year-old Sarah Page, white girl, they were lovers. Now, with the resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan, 
And there's a big resurgence of the Klan uh, because of the movie, The Birth of a Nation, uh, that debuts February 8th, 1915. And um, then you have Reverend William Joseph Simmons, who starts the second incarnation of the Ku Klux Klan, October 1915, Reverend William Joseph Simmons. After seeing the movie, The Birth of a Nation, he restarts the Klan because the Klan had largely died out by 1915. Um, a lot of the early pioneers of the Klan were dead. Uh, this is 50 years after the Klan was originally founded. You're going to have a resurgence. You're going to have a reincarnation of the Klan uh, created by Reverend William Joseph Simmons. OK, and there's an article from uh, Washington Post. That deals with uh, Reverend William Joseph Simmons and the. Um, resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, this one from the Washington Post. Uh, William Joseph Simmons. Let's see the preacher who used Christianity, who used Christianity to revive the Ku Klux Klan. OK, uh, this article here from Washington Post, the preacher who used Christianity to revive the Ku Klux Klan. OK, so much as uh, uh, love your brother and treat your brother as your neighbor and your na love your neighbor as you love yourself, all that stuff. So much for that. Um, this, so this deals with the history of uh, Reverend William Joseph Simmons. I don't have time to get into that. But read this article from Washington Post. But after seeing the movie, he's inspired to, re to rejuvenate the Klan. So the Klan had a resurgence, and there were about five hundred. There were about a hundred thousand Klan members in uh, Oklahoma. Okay, a at the time the race massacre takes place, there's about a uh, hundred thousand Klan members uh, in Oklahoma. Uh, by the mid 1920s, with, with the resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan, which had an estimated 100,000 members in Oklahoma by the mid 1920s, uh, by the mid 1920s, 100,000. Uh, you, you had a resurgence of them in 1921. It's taking place then. So they're growing and they're in Oklahoma. African-American residents in Greenwood were keenly aware of white mob violence to protect Dick Rowland from being lynched. Armed African-American men, many who wore World War I veterans, OK, many who were World War I veterans, stood guard at the courthouse where Dick Rowland was being held. OK, and it's going to grow to about 200 African-American men and they're armed. All right. You had a lot of retired World War I veterans that lived in uh, North Tulsa, lived in Green in the Greenwood District. And they said, we're not going to let them take, they know they're going to, these white men are going to lynch Dick Rowland. They said, we're not going to let them do that. Okay. And when, when uh, uh, Greenwood is invaded, these brothers are going to shoot back also. Okay. Now they're just outnumbered, but they're going to shoot back as well. So they just laid down and ran or whatever. No, we fought back and shot back. So the African-American men go to the courthouse where Dick Rowland is being held to back up the sheriff and protect Dick Rowland. Now, as tensions mounted, an angry crowd of white men arrived and the outnumbered African-American guards retreated to Greenwood. Uh, and what actually what happened was there's an incident where uh, one of the white men said to one of the African-American men, what are you doing with that gun or something like that? And he said, well, you responded, what's it to you? And then a scuffle ensues over the gun and, and the gun goes off. OK. And then from that, then all hell's going to break loose. Now, in the early morning hours of June 1st, mobs of white men descended on Greenwood, looting homes, burning down businesses and gunning down African-Americans. It was a massacre. During the massacre, at least 4,000 African-American residents were arrested by the Oklahoma National Guard and held in internment camps under martial law. They were held in internment camps under martial law. They were given green identification tags. They could only leave if a white person could vouch for them because contrary to popular belief, everybody in Tulsa, everybody in North Tulsa or Greenwood was not a millionaire. Everybody wasn't well off. You had some poor people. 
that lived in North Tulsa. But, you know, the money that they made from working for white people as domestics and things like that and butlers, what have you, because some of them went, went worked in South Tulsa for white people. OK. And like when you do like real research on this, you'll find this out. OK, everybody wasn't wealthy. Everybody wasn't a millionaire. Everybody wasn't in the oil. Everybody didn't own a business. A lot of people did, but was poor people living there as well. But they spent their money in Greenwood with African Americans. So the money was able to turn over 36, at least 36 times in general, 36, some estimates are up to 100, depending upon which year you're talking about, which point in time you're talking about. So let's continue here. All right. So you had uh, their homes and businesses torch. You had martial law declared there in in uh, the Greenwood District in North Tulsa, where African-Americans live. Uh, according to oral histories of survivors, scores of massacre victims were then buried in unmarked graves, unbeknownst to those uh, detained who waited days to be released and had no knowledge of where some of the victims had been buried. So the mob destroyed 35 square blocks um, of, of, of businesses and, and, and homes, uh, entire businesses. Uh, about 1,256 homes were destroyed. Now, when they tried to file the claims on for the insurance for homes and businesses, all of the insurance claims were denied. OK, it's about one point eight million dollars worth of damage done. One point eight million up to two million dollars worth of damage. Although the number of dead remains undetermined, it is, it is reported that 300 people, mostly African-Americans, were killed in the massacre, while a handful of African-Americans were charged with riot related offenses. OK, no white uh, Tulsa re residents were charged with murder or looting. OK, white people weren't charged with anything. The, 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 the media, the, the, the Tulsa World newspaper there. Uh, the white on newspaper, they blame African-Americans for the killing, the, for the uh, race riot. They blame them. They said it was their own fault. They said they talked about black instigators, black ag agitators. They said they blame the African-Americans for the race massacre. OK, uh, the newspaper. The uh, Tulsa World newspaper, Tulsa World newspaper, they had a headline from June 1st. And I think we have it here. Um. Uh, They had a headline from June 1st that reported two white people killed in the uh, massacre, in the in the riot. All right. You know, I posted that uh, on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. Let me try to pull that up. But they had a uh, newspaper article and it focused on two white people being killed. That was that, that was the big focus. Hundreds of African-Americans killed, but that's not what they focused on. Uh, let me see here. Now, on June 1st, uh, 2021, the headline from uh, the Tulsa World uh, newspaper was that uh, Mayor G.T. Bynum, the white mayor there in Tulsa, uh, apologizes for the uh, race massacre. OK, he apologizes for the race massacre. And let's try to post that and see if we can get that up. Now, G.T. Bynum is against reparations for the uh, survivors and their descendants. He's against reparations for them. He's against repairing the damage, even though even though uh, his family owned 931 slaves. OK, we talked about that earlier in the week. So go back and watch uh, that broadcast. I think that was from like June 3rd or something like that. The, uh, Mayor G.T. Bynum comes from a wealthy family. His family was enslaving African-Americans is documented going back to uh, about 1665. All right. And. Uh, uh, Tiffany Cross on the cross connection on MSNBC interviewed him and he talked about how, you know, he's against reparations, all that stuff. But his family uh, owned collectively 931 slaves. He said he didn't know anything about that. He didn't say it wasn't true. According to the statement that she read, she he said he didn't know anything about that. Uh, 
All right, so if we look here, this is from the Tulsa World newspaper, uh, June 1st, 1921. Headline reads, Two Whites Dead in Race Ride. Race war wait rages for hours after outbreak at courthouse, troops and armed men patrolling streets. But the headline says two whites dead in race riot. That's what they focused on. Now, the um, this one here, they have the side by side uh, 2021 mayor apologizes for a race massacre. Is the next headline. For uh, June first 2021 100 years later okay let's continue here let me pull up this one all right so scott ellsworth scott ellsworth and i saw him in the document some of the documentaries he's in the documentary from the history channel tulsa uh burning uh 1921 race massacre scott ellsworth is a professor at the university of michigan and he's the author of the book death in a promised land the tulsa race ride of 1921 death in a promised land the tulsa race ride of 1921 he said it was a big story okay uh, it was a big story. And he says several newspapers immediately covered the devastation, including the Tulsa World newspaper, the New York Times and the Times of London. And some white Tulsans boasted about the bloodshed and sold photographic postcards of the carnage. All right. So, you know, there's a history of uh, taking pictures of. Uh, lynchings, African Americans being lynched and selling them as postcards. Because I said before, you know, the dehumanization of African Americans has always been entertainment for this country. The dehumanization of African Americans has always been entertainment for this country. So you had several newspapers immediate, uh, e immediately covered the devastation, uh, including the Tulsa World, the New York Times, and the Times of London, and some. Uh, white Tulsans boasted about the bloodshed and sold photographic postcards of the carnage, but a culture of silence soon became the norm. A culture of silence soon became the norm. Uh, Scott Ellsworth, Professor Scott Ellsworth said the businessmen, the political types, and whatnot all realized fairly quickly that they had a huge PR problem with the massacre. See, the massacre wasn't good for business because oil was discovered in 1905 in Tulsa, in Oklahoma, and, and Tulsa was known as the oil capital of the world, all right? So you can't have a race massacre taking place in the oil capital of the world. That's not good for business. People won't, will not want to move to Oklahoma, will not want to move to Tulsa. With Tulsa trying to maintain its place, as the oil capital of the world, the riot or race massacre reflected terribly on the city and subsequently was not included in history books or newspapers for decades, nor was it openly discussed in both the African-American and white communities. Some newspaper accounts from the period were even removed. Some newspaper accounts from the period were even removed before editions of that newspaper were, were recorded on microfilms, according to the Tulsa World. The Tulsa World is admitting what happened. White residents did not want to admit. Now, this, this is taking place today because there's a lot of white people in, in Tulsa that they don't want to talk about it. Now, you have some that will talk about it and say, yeah, my great granddaddy was there and he killed the, the, the African Americans, things like this. But you have some of them, they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to deal with reparations. They just want to act like this don't this didn't happen. That was a hundred years. That was a long time ago. It was a hundred years ago. Okay. Uh, now they may celebrate President's Day, celebrate Fourth of July. Well, that was 1776. That was further back. I ain't a mathematician, but I think 1776 was was longer ago than uh 1921. You you want to celebrate 1776, but you don't want to deal with 1921. Some of them may celebrate Confederates Day and all types of nonsense like that. 
white residents did not want to admit that relatives or friends had participated in the massacre. And African-American residents did not want to pass on the pain to their children, says Michelle Place, executive director of the Tulsa Historical Society and Museum. She said, if you if you told them the stories of how hard you had worked, what you had built and and how we lost it, then that sets the children up for fear that it could happen again. If you told them the stories of how hard you had worked, what you had built and how we lost it, then that sets the children up for fear that it could happen again, she says. All right, so the Greenwood residents lost everything. We do know that uh, it was rebuilt after the race massacre. We talked about that before. Some fled to return. Uh, some fled to never return, lost their land. OK, and a lot of the land, uh, the, the, the clip I played from Tiffany Cross's show, OK, uh, the cross connection when she was there in Tulsa. I think that was like March 28th. They talk. One of the things they talked about is how most of the land that's there in North Tulsa now that black people used to own is owned by the city of Tulsa. Because these African-Americans fled and their land was taken. So some fled never to return while others were relegated to living in tents and getting assistance from the Red Cross. Because the Red Cross set up a makeshift hospital in Booker T. Washington uh, High School. The Red Cross set up a makeshift hospital in Booker T. Washington High School. And they're going to tend to uh, the victims. So the count of 300 uh, victims that comes from the Red Cross. OK, uh, so they got assistance from the Red Cross until they had the means and materials to rebuild. Though. African-American residents filed one point eight million dollars in riot related claims with insurance companies, they were all denied. All the claims were denied. African-Americans were blamed for the race massacre. You instigated it. It's your fault. But rebuilding began within months and community gyms like the Dreamland Theater, OK, uh, reopened along with stores and other buildings. And what's going to happen is, is it's going to be thriving again in 1926 when Dr. W.B. DeBois visits because we rebuilt Greenwood. And some estimates are that it was built better the second time than the first time. We rebuilt it. It was thriving in the 1950s and 60s. But largely what's going to happen, you, you have expressways that come through in 1970, and that's going to wipe out businesses. Homes are going to be taken through eminent domain. You are going to have some African-Americans when um, uh, civil rights laws come and desegregation is, is struck down. You're going to have some African-Americans who, who are taking some money uh, in, into South Tulsa and spending it in South Tulsa. You're going to have some pioneers who die out. They leave land or businesses to their children or grandchildren, the children or grandchildren. Some of them keep it and, and continue. Others don't want it and sell it, move away. OK, but the, what was going to be really devastating is when expressways come through. And that's what we, we, we've been talking about the past week. What's going to be really devastating is when the expressways come through. And we know that that comes from the U.S. Interstate Highway Act of 1952 and 56 that drive about 41,000 miles of U.S. Interstate Highways all across the country. All right. Those watching on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network and my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotel. Keep watching. We're going to keep broadcasting for a few more minutes. I'll be in Atlanta um, for uh, Friday, June 18th through Sunday, June 20th at Centennial Park at the ninth annual uh, Juneteenth uh festival juneteenth music festival and parade visit juneteenthatl.com juneteenthatl.com for more information i'll be speaking that saturday sunday 3 p.m to 4 p.m at the amp uh, at the amphitheater amphitheater um and i'll have a vendor booth there as well 
we'll put this information at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. They have, they showed out on vendor booths. Um, but I talked to Bob Johnson, who organizes this. They showed out a bit on vendor booth, vendor booths, not the Bob Johnson from BET. That they usually have like 100 to 130 African American vendors, et cetera. They have musical acts. Uh, uh, Rest of Development is performing this year. Uh, Rest of Development, Everyday People in Tennessee, they're performing. Angie Stone is performing. Um, so come on out. Be sure to register for my online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. We teach this on Saturdays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's a 10 week uh, online course. We deal with thousands of years of history. It's on, uh, we have a discount now. It's only $60 for the 10 weeks. Dr. David M. Hotel, author of the book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence. He will be uh, our guest speaker on Saturday, June 12th. So register for the course. You can register at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And also you can support the African History Network, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App or through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. And we do it through Cash App. Be sure to type in dollar sign the AHN show, S-H-O-W. All right. We're out of time here. Remember, right now is correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. All right. Stand by, everybody. We're going to keep going for a couple more minutes here. Not much longer, but we'll keep going for a couple more minutes. We'll try to give a uh, update here. Uh, when you do this through Cash App, you know uh, I talked about how there's a fake Cash, uh, uh, fake Cash App uh, account set up. It's a fake African History Network Cash App account set up. So when you do it, um, like I said before, mine is our tag is uh dollar sign the a h n show s h o w and it says michael and it shows my picture there these other ones are fake if you donate it before to these fake african history network uh cash app accounts let cash app know let them know you've been scammed uh there's an option when you go into uh your app there's an option there problem with payment you can choose which payment and uh, you can let them know that you were scammed. You were trying to send it to dollar sign the AHN show. You see this one. You see this cash app tag is dollar sign the AHN SHOW, SHO, SHO, no W. Okay. And this tag is dollar sign the AHN S. These are all fake. That's not me. Okay. So they've been, they've been stealing from us. Uh, so contact cash app. This is ours right here, dollar sign, the AHN show, S-H-O-W. All right. Okay. And then you can also support us through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. And we have the information at our website at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. So this helps us keep doing the research. We have six days a week broadcasting. This helps us keep broadcasting, finance the show, keep doing the research, pay some of the bills, et cetera. Get back and forth to uh, Atlanta, cover expenses things like that. All right. And then also register for uh, the online course that I teach on Saturdays. All right, let's continue here for a few more minutes. Um, okay. So we're dealing with the article. Dealing with how was this covered up for so long? How was this covered up for so long? So we have the rebuilding of um, dreamland. Dreamland Theater. Uh, now, as the civil rights era brought hard fought change to the nation, Greenwood began to decline, even though it's still thriving in the 50s and 60s. Uh, all of the entrepreneurs began to uh, age out and their children did not want to take over the beauty shop or the grocery store or the movie theater. Many of them had gotten their education and became professionals and moved out of Greenwood to different parts of the country, says Michelle Place, okay, um, with the uh, Tulsa Historical Society, Tulsa Historical Society Museum. Uh, many of them had gotten their education and become professionals and moved out of Greenwood to different parts of the country. And she said, segre uh, and she added that with segregation, dollars were once concentrated in Greenwood, uh, but now they were spent elsewhere. 
So you're going to have that taking place. Some dollars are spent elsewhere. Some are being spent there because it's still thriving in the 60s. But it's, you have this decline taking place for a number of reasons. But in the 70s, when expressways come through, that's really going to be the death nail. Um, that coupled with urban renewal efforts that inserted an interstate highway through Greenwood drastically changed the area. That's uh, uh, Interstate 244. And then also you have U.S. Uh, 75 freeway as well. OK, so check out the rest of this uh, piece here from History dot com. How the Tulsa race massacre was covered up. There were people threatened not to talk about this as well. Some of the documentaries that came out uh, recently that's discussed. There were people threatened not to talk about it. Um, and there was also a frustration and the pain that a lot of African Americans had about recounting it. All right. There was a, um, but this really becomes a national story in 1998. Okay. I was where this really, really gets exposed. All right. Lastly, there is a, um, there's a piece from independent.co.uk. Uh, Tulsa race massacre, five more bodies found at mass grave site. Tulsa race massacre, five more bodies found at uh, mass grave site. And let's see here. It talks about the Oakland Cemetery uh, grave site is estimated to hold 30 bodies or more. So when you watch the various documentaries, you heard them talk about the Oakland Cemetery. Okay, hold on, let's see here. Uh, crew members, now this article is from uh, June 4th, 2021. Uh, crew members have found five more coffins of people believed to be victims in the 1921 Tulsa race massacre, officials said. Finding the five additional coffins brings the total number of people found at the mass grave site at Oakland Cemetery in Tulsa, Oklahoma to 20. OK, uh, it was 18. OK, but uh, well, let me see if it's. Maybe less than that. OK, maybe it's 15 or something like that. But now it brings the total to 18. Uh, the five uh, finding five additional coffins brings the total number of people found at the mass grave site at Oakland Cemetery in Tulsa, Oklahoma, to 20. Uh, the search began last year with crew members finding at least 12 different sets of remains believed to be victims in the massacre. But authorities have yet to confirm uh, those people were killed during the horrific event. OK, because you have to determine, OK, when were they killed? Just because you find a body buried there doesn't mean that it's because of the Tulsa race massacre. So you have to determine, OK, when were they killed? But authorities have yet to confirm these people were killed during the horrific event. Now, the remains were covered uh, back up and expected to be studied at a later date. With the most recent findings, excavation and analysis uh, was expected to be completed this week and crews would then start the formal ex uh, exhumation uh, process on June 7th for the, uh, for the found remains. State archaeologist Kerry Stackelbeck uh, S-T-A-C-K-E-L-B-E-C-K, -E -E Carrie Stackel Stackelbeck, has estimated that 30 bodies or more are likely buried at the site. 30 bodies or more are likely buried at the site. Now, during the Tulsa race massacre, which took place from May 31st to June 1st, 1921. Uh, okay, we know the details. Uh, the mob attack residents, making it one of the most violent uh, racial events is a race massacre. Uh, probably the most violent uh, news reports of the events were largely silenced from covering what took place during the massacre, which has led to uncertainty about how many people were killed. Now, after the massacre, city officials claimed only 36 people, including 12 white people were killed. OK, notice most 
notice how they just focus on the white people who were killed. It, it's like at least 300 people were killed, most of them African American. City officials claim 36 people were killed, including 12 white people. And then when you look at the when you look at the uh the cover of the uh Tulsa uh world on uh June 1st and this looks like this was their evening edition okay when you look at that and let me pull this back up here you look at that they focus on the headline was two dead white people two white people dead that was the headline let's let me go back to this here for my facebook page let me bring that up okay right here so the headline from the Tulsa World, June 1st, 1921. This is the final edition. You see it up here, final edition. Two whites dead in race riot. Race war wages for hours after outbreak at courthouse, troops and armed men patrolling streets. Okay, let's see here. All right, so after the massacre, city officials claimed only 36 people, including 12 white people, were killed. But historians have now estimated the death toll to be between 75 to 300. It was at least 300. That was the count from the Red Cross, and the Red Cross was tending to the victims who could make it there to the makeshift hospital. Thousands of residents were also left homeless. Okay, all right. So check out the rest of this here. Tulsa Race Massacre. Five more bodies found at mass grave site. This is from uh, independent.co.uk. All right. Look, we have to get out of here. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, you can support us through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me uh, forward slash the AHN show. And we are here uh, Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to 12 midnight Eastern Standard Time. And uh, Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We have six days a week. Follow us on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, and uh, our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. We broadcast, rebroadcast these shows throughout the day. And uh, these shows are archived there, Facebook and YouTube, but also in audio podcast format. Audio podcast format. Uh, download the iHeartRadio app and uh, search for uh, the African History Network show. You, you can also search for 9, 10 a.m. the Superstation, uh, WFDF as well. And you'll be able to um, listen live. When we're on live, you can listen. But also, if you search for the African History Network show, it has my audio podcast there, okay? All right. Uh, Saturday, June 12th, our guest speaker in my online class will be uh, Dr. David M. Hotep, author of the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. So we have a lot of information to share. He's going to give you background information dealing with uh, the African presence in this country going back tens of thousands of years. He'll talk about new research. He'll talk about his new book as well.